part of the kind of psycho, let's say, like the, the psychological anima of the market is that it provides people, yeah, with a, a scaffolding and, and infrastructure through which to relieve themselves of their family. Right. So the way I see it, and, and you'll let me know if this dovetails or in fact conflicts or maybe it's just mm-hmm. total miss, is that the family and the religion mm-hmm. or culture mm-hmm. provide many of the same things that the market provides, like let's say an insurance policy, mm-hmm. right? So for example, um, if you're trying to smooth your income stream over a lifetime and you have recessions, a family might take in some members who are out of work and put them to work in portions of the family business that are still functioning or work inside the home Mm -hmm. um, in a way that sort of socializes some of the risk. And at the same time, you might buy some kind of a, a policy to try to smooth things out, you know, or or you'll, you'll you'll try to save uh, in an institutional context as these things conflict, um, the market has denatured some of these older structures. When people talk about American families are weak, mm-hmm. what they usually mean is, is that American markets have been regular and strong enough mm-hmm. that people have leaned less on the mm-hmm. pathologies of their mishbucha mm-hmm. uh, in order to try to get cleaner expressions within the market for, mm-hmm. for their various needs. Like instead of having you know, a mother uh, come and be with a child when a new baby is do born. Do your laundry. Yeah. What? <laughs> yeah, to yeah. Do your laundry, yeah. That you hire somebody to do it. Mm-hmm. And the idea is if the market is working in some sense, yeah. the family starts to fall apart because you don't need it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, people are smart. They know that like seven, eight years of psychoanalysis is a very tall price to pay for having your mother come every week and do your laundry. It's an interesting And period. they'd rather be, yeah. Um, and there's this, you know, whole rhetoric now about a work-life balance, whatever. And I think that the, the, the market, part of the kind of psycho, let's say, like the, the psychological anima of the market is that it provides people, yeah, with a, a scaffolding and, and infrastructure through which to relieve themselves of their family. Right. So one of the... Um... One of the things that's interesting to me is is that you're coming from a background which is very familiar to me, where you have a Jewish Armenian uh, parentage, and your father is a famous mathematician working in linear programming, mm-hmm. sort of optimization mm-hmm. science, and came up with um, this amazing algorithm that changed our picture for how things could be optimized using smaller and smaller ellipsoids. Right. And your mom, how did she figure into the story? Um, I, I, my, my dad, uh, his whole kind of, uh, level of achievement is way over my head, obviously. Um, but, uh, my, my mom and my dad, I mean, they met when they were very young and they got married quite a bit later. My mom, I think uh, would probably be very, irate and disappointed if I described her like this, because you know, she's going to listen to this. Um, she is an artist, but I, who became a housewife basically. Okay. And I think that she is the great genius of the family. She's the, the great kind of organizing and destructive force in my family. Well, it's interesting. Very often um, in the, so I, I have to say that when we had this lunch, which you're describing as a power lunch, yet yeah. I drank no alcohol during yeah. it. So I'm not positive that it qualified. What well, I mean? Are you supposed to drink? I don't really know. Drink? It would okay. be my first power lunch. Oh right! I have to. It's just you know a stupid uh, girl bossy hyperbolic term. I have I to. See. I have to drink. Okay. Well, very and good. And smoke at all lunches. I didn't smoke. You didn't smoke. But I'm such a neurotic. I'm so shy. I was telling you that I can't. You know, I have to constantly occupy. Uh, is that because you're reveling in your neuroticism? No, no, no. I'm not like a Woody Allen person. I don't okay. get off on it. Oh, you sure? It's something that I hope to, to shed with a, okay. a, the kind of accumulation of experience, like habituation. Okay. Yeah, that's not something I think you should look up to in yourself. I don't know. Um, But yeah, I think that uh, my mom is kind of like a bizarre 
freewheeling artistic genius, um, a true eccentric. And I think that I derive a lot of my personality and my tendency toward critique from her. I mean, she's always spinning paranoid polemics about the world. It's really quite impressive. And she's right most of the time. I think it's very strange that, I mean, this really actually echoes your earlier point that we tend to see accomplishment only if it shows up in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of us coming from kind of ethnic families, for lack of a better word, very often people who were inside the home were well known to be the local genius mm -hmm. or the eccentric or the life or the whatever. Mm -hmm. It was not clear in any way that uh, if you were the Shmata salesman, that that was really the higher expression mm -hmm. of the two people in a marriage. Mm -hmm. And it happens that your father did something very creative yes. in a very analytic context. Yeah, it's yeah. hardly surprising. Like there's nothing at all surprising to me that your mom might mostly be at home with the family and be the major force of the family. Yeah, and I think like, you know, my, my dad probably gets all the credit for um, be for uh being kind of the genius um my haters like to point out that i'm coasting off of my father's accomplishments which is not true because i'm actually way more famous than him on reddit so there yeah there you go um he, he would be so uh i i'm here to disgrace my family name um but basically i, I think that it's a very interesting this this kind of old breakdown of my parents' marriage is a very instructive example of the way that women wield unofficial power through the domestic sphere. Again, it's like unofficial. Like, the language is even wrong to me. It's like, in what world do we not... I, I guess the idea is that it's official if it shows up in Wikipedia and it's unofficial if it only shows up in family I, lore. I think it's official if you're getting officially compensated for it, right? Okay, well, this yeah. is the issue of kin work that I would yeah. bring up, which is that I think that a lot of the um, wage gap work is extremely weak and manipulative, but I think it's also the case that the real wage gap is that you have to figure out how to compensate uh, for kin work you know, mm -hmm. taking care of uh, of elder relatives or young children, mm -hmm. and that you can arguably say that women should be paid more on average because that is uncompensated work and it mm -hmm. has to show up somewhere. And sometimes it would show up in like prestige. The matriarch of a, of a, of a large family is kind of a, an impressive position to right. hold. And that with smaller families, it's no longer so cool to be grandma. Yeah, sure. And I think that there's a general disrespect for the institution of motherhood. That's let's, let's talk a, about that. What the hell is that? In the culture at large, particularly on the left. Um, so that this is something which I totally resonate with. Like, when did the left go? And, and they, they're going to claim, oh, we're not anti-family. But there is some weird anti-family thing. Um, I think that that's absolutely a kind of collective defense mechanism. Because we're talking about people much like myself who are millennials in their late 20s early 30s um you know my father was, always used to say like well anna you can't really ascend in class you know contrary to the myth of the american dream but you can't really fall in class either and now we're faced with a generation that's quite a bit like the lost generation in, in russia my father's generation all of whom who drank themselves to death by the age of you know 52 um uh, which is this millennial generation of people like myself. So who, your dad was two years younger than I am now when he died of a heart attack. Yes, yeah. Um, and, you know, he died in, in the United States, but I think that he is part of the same generational trend. What year was that? In uh, 2005. Um, but uh, there are a lot of people my age who are confront male and female who are confronting for the first time the reality that they will actually um fall in class in especially relative to their parents they will yeah. never own property they will never pay off their student debt they will never have a, a safe and dependable health care situation they will never be able to afford children and i think the kind of a broadly anti-natalist trend on the left is a psychological defense mechanism because you have to reframe i think in the neoliberal framework you have to reframe all adversity as opportunity 
and uh, what they're saying to themselves. Well, you know, I don't have to be burdened by babies. Yes. My, my breasts will be undeformed by breastfeeding. Yes, I'm a girl boss. I don't need a man. I'm an independent, strong, independent right. woman. Um, uh, so they've had to kind of recalibrate. By the way, this will work out for a minority of the people who claim this to be true. Right. It's not BS. What's it's BS not. is how broadly this plan is likely to work. Yeah, how applicable it is across. I mean, I started noticing, I actually got a lot of flack for this and I, I still don't know why. I started noticing in the pop lyrics of the last two decades or so, kind of minute shift. Um, you can go back as far as actually the 1960s. I remember this interview with Amy Winehouse where she's like, you know, I much, I, I much more prefer, I gravitate toward the music of the 60s, uh, the 50s 60s whatever uh, as opposed to the music of the 2000s because in the kind of female vocalists of the 60s they expressed kind of a longing a, a yearning for companionship and love a desire to subordinate themselves to the will of others or something greater than themselves let's put it that way that feminists have interpreted as a fundamentally kind of misogynistic or sexist outlook Whereas now, you know, with the, the coming of somebody like Beyonce, you have these lyrics that literally are like, I don't need you. I don't need a man. All men are trash. I'm going to keep stacking my bills. And it's it's this form of feminism that I find to be very callous and cretinous and ultimately counterproductive. It's actually, I mean, let's, let's take what you just said. It was actually weirdly... Uh, on both sides of the gender aisle. For example, um, let's say John Denver, um, when he sings about, uh, you know, that's a kiss me and smile for me, tell mm -hmm. me that you'll wait for me. He talks about, um, when I come back, uh, I'll bring your wedding ring. Mm -hmm. Like he's excited about the fact that he's screwed up in this relationship. Mm -hmm. He says, I've played around. And then he says, uh, but I, I realize how important this is and I'm going to make it right. And I'm mm -hmm. excited about becoming betrothed to you. Right. I'm going I, to make amends. Well, not only make amends, I, you know, like when Beyonce, I mean, just to, to, to connect these two data points, she's saying, if you like it, you should put a ring on it. Like mm -hmm. she, that's really what she wanted. Mm -hmm. But like you didn't, you didn't exercise your options, very transactional. Mm -hmm. So now I'm up, I'm up in the club getting jiggy with this other guy. You shouldn't be upset. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's it's it is a very kind of transactional ethos that permeates all. Like there was this like kind of stupid trend on Twitter where people or, or, that people were mocking because um, other people were tweeting out kind of empathy templates. So you know, if somebody texts you and they're like, "Hey, I'm like really going through a hard time. You know, I'm having a, get, getting a divorce. My mom's dying of cancer, or whatever." You fire back with like, "Hey, I'm currently at capacity. Do you know somebody else who slash I'm going through some personal problems too slash?" And it's like a kind of prefabricated template for how you should respond to a person in need. Wow. Yeah, this, this no, is I the did, thing. I didn't even, this is how yeah, we do you're it so now? lucky. You're you're so lucky that all this stuff is way over your head. I have to live with this every day and it shrinks my will and libido to live. But it's like this kind of thing that um, is hyper transactional. All relations have become so transactional. All relationships, I mean, look, my take on this is that all relationships have an aspect of exchange, right? but that what distinguishes the transactional from the rich relationship is how many layers of indirection separate uh, the people involved right. from the exchange. Yes. So dinner in a movie is a lot more abstract than turning a trick on a street corner. Yeah. And then you, you go further, you know, with courtship, it, it becomes incredibly distant in uh -huh. terms of the number of layers. And what we don't recognize is, is that those layers of indirection are essential to a rich life. Yeah, and a, a rich emotional life. And what we're dealing with now are, are people who, if they are not economically uh, impoverished or spiritually impoverished, because they have no institutions or values uh, on which to depend. 